Hi, I'm Misty Jesse, and I welcome you to our Growing in the Word Gospel of Mark online series. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation, which is Unit 3. We will be covering chapters 7 through 10. Before we begin, let's take a moment to clear our thoughts and open our minds and our hearts to the Word of God as I begin our study with a prayer. As we open our Bibles, we also open our heart that these words of truth may fall upon the very fabric of our lives. May these ancient scriptures come alive within us to inspire, to heal, to cleanse, to teach, to restore, and to guide our hearts and mind. Lord, come weave your words of life in us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without ending. Amen. So today we open with chapter 7, which has a focus on Jewish traditions and faith. Mark is trying to convince non-believing Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. During Mark's time, Christianity is still a sect within Judaism. Hence, throughout Mark's gospel, we have an intentional outreach to the Jewish community to accept Jesus. There are many boundaries in the Jewish faith emphasized by laws, rules, and regulations. The book of Leviticus highlights the focus on the laws. Traditionally, in Judaism, when a child begins to learn the Torah, the first book studied is actually Leviticus, the emphasis again being the law and the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments um, are a gift from God which teach how to live in relationship with God and how to also live in relationship with each other. So this debate that takes place with Jesus and the religious leaders is one which concerns the boundaries which Jesus keeps crossing. Specifically, how Jesus interacts with the Gentiles and also how he interacts with people who in traditional Jewish mentality these people are thought of as unclean. So in the eyes of the religious leaders, Jesus has done several transgressions, one having to do with food. Now, God has provided specific boundaries to the Jewish people in regards to food and the preparation of food. So adhering to these laws requires following specific purity rituals, which the Gentiles are not following. As a result, um, Jews do not normally eat with Gentiles. However, we have Jesus seen repeatedly sitting, talking, touching, and eating with Gentiles. The topic now has become a point of contention with Jesus and the Pharisees. So Jesus is a rabbi, um, and like the Pharisees, so he's having this argument back and forth with them. And they're claiming that Jesus is going against the Ten Commandments and as such is questioning the Word of God. So they accuse Jesus of blasphemy, challenging the Ten Commandments, in other words, the Word of God. And the Ten Commandments were given by the great prophet and lawgiver Moses. So we have Jesus, who in the Jewish mind among the religious leaders, um, has behavior which is challenging the laws, um, now in regards to kosher foods, and also the Jewish lifestyle. So we're going to open with chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. And it has to do with this um, accusation from the Pharisees and the response from Jesus. Now, when the Pharisees with the scribes, who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around him, they observed that some of his disciples ate their meals with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees, and in fact all Jews, do not eat without carefully washing their hands, keeping the tradition of the elders. And on coming from the marketplace, they do not eat without purifying themselves. And there are many other things that they have traditionally observed, 
the purification of cups and jugs and kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and scribes questioned him, Why do your disciples not follow the tradition of the elders, but instead eat a meal with unclean hands? He responded, Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching us doctrines, human precepts. So Jesus' point is that following the law with outward actions is a physical response and meaningless if the actions are not from the heart. God calls us to fulfill the law with our hearts, our very inner being. So for Jesus, it's not about what goes in the mouth, but it is about what comes out. Words and the life one lives in relationship with others reflect the true inner soul of a person responding to God's call. So the catechism for this particular reading here um, on Jesus' interpretation of God's word is Catechism 581. Catechism 581. So Jesus is telling him that the purity rituals are meaningless if a person is not following through with them in the life that they lead. So for Jesus, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they're hypocrites. They're acting one way and they're living another. And so now the focus becomes on what goes in and what comes out of a person. So let's take a look at verses 18 through 21, chapter 7, verses 18 through 21. He said to them, Are even you likewise without understanding? Do you not realize that everything that goes into a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart but the stomach and passes out into the latrine? Thus he declared all foods clean. But what comes out of a person that is what defiles? From within, from their hearts, come evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, and folly. So Jesus makes these statements with authority. And how can he do this? Because he is the Son of God, as affirmed at his baptism. As the living word of God, Jesus provides us the authoritative interpretation of the law. The religious leaders still do not understand this. And despite repeated conversations with the religious leaders, they're unable to give up the laws and the many processes that they've evolved um, with keeping the laws, including their eating rituals involving purification and consecration. And we actually have a catechism that looks at this dietary law, That catechism is 582, Catechism 582. The laws are found in the book of Leviticus, and they were specifically made for the Levites, the priestly class, the laws in that book of Leviticus. Um, So the priest, in order to serve at the Jerusalem temple, um, they needed to be ritually clean and pure. And that required a ritual cleaning in this bath, which is called a mikvah. So in this picture, we have um, the remains of an ancient mikvah. And so um, they would have to actually go into the bath one way, come out another way, and they immerse themselves three times reciting psalms. So all their orifices are cleansed, um, and they're coming out uh, ritually holy um, and prepared. So once that bath is complete... Um, the priest uh, won't touch anything that would make him unclean again. And that would include not eating any food, uh, especially any food that's not kosher. Um, And this ritual bath and that adherence to all these purity laws, it's very time-consuming and onerous. Um, And so what happened is over time, the Levites actually expanded these laws, which were, you know, devised for them to include all the Jews. Now, Mosaic Law has four areas which require ritual cleaning, cleansing that uses the mikvah. Um, the first one is after the birth of a child. Secondly, after any contact with the dead. Uh, third is when you're preparing you know, the body for burial. 
Um, third is after the healing of a skin disease. And fourth is after the healing of any kind of running sores. Now, in addition to these four areas, also family purity is guarded with very strict rules pertaining to the sexes. So by the time of Jesus, Jews included ceremonial washing of S hands prior to eating. So these are things that evolved. They weren't there that Moses wrote them out. Um, and boundaries in regards to purity surround the Jewish people, actually isolating them from the Gentiles. And Jesus challenges these expanding laws. They have, in Jesus' mind and words, they become a yoke upon the people's neck. Now, the marketplace is an area where religious Jews will obviously come into contact with Gentiles or other Jews who don't observe the ceremonial law, um, therefore becoming unclean because they're interacting, possibly bumping into them. In addressing the elders in the topic of food and eating practices, Jesus actually sets aside that law of clean and unclean food. He opens the door for unity between Gentiles and Jews in the kingdom of God. So Jesus has been teaching us that purity comes from within a person, from the heart, and not from ritual behavior such as the washing of the hands or the type of food that is eaten. So for Jesus, all food is clean. Now, in front of you is a chart um, which depicts those things which the Jewish people consider clean and unclean food. So, I mean, there's very specific guidelines as to what they can and cannot eat, what is considered kosher and what isn't. So for Mark's audience, this becomes very much a controversial and a decisive issue. The, when the Jewish Christians return to Rome, remember Mark's audience is a Roman audience, after the, the death of the Emperor Nero, they find that they're actually in a minority to the Gentile Christians. So these issues about diet and circumcision create mounting tensions between that community, and Mark tries to address them in his gospel. Now, Jesus and the religious leaders, they continue their debate. Jesus makes it clear that he's not shunning Jewish customs, but he does seek and he does come to bring reform. So for Jesus, people must honor God, God with their hearts, um, not with meaningless actions. And it's all about the revelations of the heart, the internal realities, not the external issues. Jesus talks about the korban. Now, the korban is an offering or a sacrifice that's dedicated to God. In this instance, uh, that particular vow would be one that has to do with money, um, the tithing that's given to God. Um, the Talmud, which is a Jewish commentary, notes that Jews tended to give, uh, make very rash vows to God, and frequently they did this with no honest intention of carrying them out. And again, Jesus points to the Ten Commandments now. He's talking to the religious leaders, and he specifically charges them with, well, what about the commandment about honoring one's parents? And apparently it turns out that many religious leaders claim that, um, that they can't uphold that commandment because they made a korban, in other words, a vow to God, that their money um, actually is dedicated to God in the temple. Therefore, they have nothing left to care for their parents. So Jesus calls them out on this. And he points to their, you know, their rashness and their oaths and their failure to keep, um, follow through and, and uh, commit to their vows, including following the commandments given by Jesus with the failure to care for their parents. So he says that that money that they vowed to the temple and God is actually being used for their own personal gains. Again, they're hypocrites. They're claiming that they're doing something for God but they're failing to do what God actually called them to do in the Ten Commandments, which is to take care of their parents. Needless to say, this discussion just added to the mounting um, hostility rising between Jesus and the religious leaders. Now, all around them, while this dialogue is going on, there are crowds. Um, and so both the Gentiles and the Jews hear the exchange. And these countercultural statements that Jesus is making um, continue to grow and have effect on the crowds and the masses because Jesus is providing a message of hope and the possibility of an opportunity. 
Jesus is saying that there is a way beyond these very stringent and onerous laws to come into a relationship with God, one that's not been narrowed to the point of impossibility by the religious leadership. And through all of these exchanges, Jesus continues to speak with wisdom and authority. Now, after this series of confrontation with the religious leaders, Jesus proceeds to travel from Capernaum into the Gentile territory of Tyre. That's about a 30 miles uh, distance. In Tyre, this Syrophoenician, in other words, a Greek woman, comes out and seeks him. She actually seeks him out. She's desperate. And she's asking specifically for healing for her daughter, who is possessed by a demon. So the woman pleads with Jesus, who responds by saying, well, why should I give anything to the dogs? Very strong rhetoric. And for the contemporary audience of us today to be calling somebody a dog, let alone out of the mouth of Jesus, comes across as very unexpected and insulting, not something you would expect. So dogs um, in the ancient world were considered unclean. And apparently, that's a standard term that Jews would use whenever they referred to Gentiles. Okay, so now let's look at the boundaries um, that Jesus continues to cross. First of all, he's in Gentile territory. And not only that, but he's talking to a woman, and it's a Gentile woman. Now, this woman, despite, um, you know, Jesus' reticence of having to do anything, having anything to do with her, she doesn't give up. She's very persistent. Um, and Jesus states um, that, you know, it's not right for him to take the food from the children. In other words, the gifts, the message that he's brought to the children, which are a traditional term for the children of Israel, the people of Israel. But the woman continues arguing. She points out that even the dogs receive the crumbs from a children's tables. And in this particular instance, the woman actually wins the argument. And Jesus agrees. He looks at her and he says, you know what? It's your persistent faith that has won this argument. So Jesus exercises the demon from her daughter. Now, that type of dialogue exchange that we saw taking place um, is one that is uh, found among the Greek philosophical group referred to as the cynics. Um, and it's a dialogue that's filled with both impudence and wit. So, you know, she was very snappy in her responses to um, Jesus. So let's look at that interchange between, the, between Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. Chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. From that place, he went off to the district of Tyre. He entered a house and wanted no one to know about it, but he could not escape notice. Soon, a woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him. She came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to drive the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children scrapped. Then he said to her, For saying this, you may go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. When the women went home, she found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. So Jesus' first priority is the Israelites, the children of God, that Old Testament term. However, the crumbs are for everyone. And the woman has now forced Jesus to share his message with a much wider audience than just the Israelites. Okay, so we're told that Jesus is on the move. He's traveling now from Capernaum. Here we go. All right, he's traveling from Capernaum to the port city of Tyre. And Tyre is um, a very busy port city within the Roman Empire. Ancient ruins um, in, the, in the site of Tyre. Now notice in the background, you see the modern day city that's built up around these ancient ruins. Tyre is located in what we know as Lebanon. Now as a port city, Tyre is a melting pot with plenty of opportunities 
for the exchange of ideas. Port cities such as Tyre help spread the good news, particularly after the resurrection. The extensive networks of Roman roads and ports were critical for the rapid dissemination of information and also maintaining control over such a vast empire. As Jesus moves through Gentile territory, um, discourse is much more open and less confrontational as the people from these um, Gentile areas tend to represent all parts of the empire. And so they're used to and exposed to different points of view. In contrast, um, Jewish cities such as Jerusalem are very concerned with issues such as diet, religious laws, and rules, a much more insular society and less open to new and novel ideas. Now, Jesus next, we're told, travels from Tyre to Sidon, and he's heading toward the coastline of Galilee and the cities that we know as the Decapolis. The people bring him a deaf mute to heal. So with this incredibly vivid imagery, Mark depicts for us Jesus doing the healing by reaching out, touching the man, first by putting his finger in the man's ear, and then by spitting on his hand and touching the man's tongue. Then he looks up to the heaven, and in Aramaic, he says, Ephetha, which means to be open, to be released. Now, that imagery of Jesus putting a finger in the man's ear and then a spit on the man's tongue is somewhat uncomfortable for us today. But in the time of Jesus, these apparently were typical actions that one would expect of a healer or a magician. So Mark's audience would have looked at this as totally normal. Now, the once deaf man's reaction to the healing is what? Straight away. That language used by Mark, which indicates it's more than just a healing. The man's ears have been opened and his tongue has been freed. So the faith of those who brought the man are also a key component to that healing. God wants healing. He hopes that, what, people will see, hear, and understand his word and be healed. In other words, they're going to be brought back into relationship with him. We're looking at, we're in chapter 7, verses 32 to 35. And people brought to him a deaf man who had a speech impediment and begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him off by himself away from the crowd. He put his finger into the man's ears and spitting touched his tongue. Then he looked to heaven and groaned and said to him, Ephetha, that is, be opened. And immediately the man's ears were opened. His speech impediment was removed and he spoke plainly. Now, the crowds can continue to grow around Jesus. Um, and we know that we are told that he's traveled from here, Tyre to Sidon, okay? And now he's moving, and that's about 25 miles from Tyre to Sidon. And now he's going to be moving back around this area, the 10 cities that uh, surround Galilee um, and are known as the uh, the Decapolis. So you can see from Galilee to Tyr to Sidon, and he just keeps moving, right? And the crowds are following him, and they're growing. In the healing of the deaf mute, um, notice that it is other people who have faith in Jesus. They're the ones that bring the deaf mute to Jesus, um, and they know what Jesus can do. But the deaf mute also has faith, he can see, and quite possibly he's actually seen the miracles. So in the case of the deaf mute, we are told Jesus takes the man away from the crowd and does the healing. So Jesus is traveling outside of the Jewish sector, working among the Gentiles. Why? Because of the mounting tensions with the religious leaders. Now, Jesus is going to continue his mission, and he needs to reach out to as many people as he can, sharing the news of the kingdom of heaven. Mark intentionally tells us that Jesus in the, is moving into the Decapolis district, the Gentile territory. And so that message again is going to resonate with that Gentile Christian community in Rome that Mark is addressing. In other words, Jesus's message is not inclusive. It's not just for the Jews. 
Mark's gospel, you know, is an evangelization tool for spreading the word among the Gentile Christians and, again, establishing the credibility of the story of Jesus. Sidon is an ancient port city which dates back to the time of the Phoenicians, um, located also in present-day Lebanon. Now, the apostles who are traveling with Jesus will later return to many of these sites, and the port cities are going to be critical for the early missionaries as they share the good news of Jesus throughout the empire. Since many of Jesus' miracles actually take place in these cities, um, the f- people are familiar with Jesus, and so that adds to the credibility of the early evangelization efforts and the spread of Christianity. Okay, so the Decapolis are those um, these 10 cities highlighted in red, right? and Jesus apparently is walking and traveling with the apostles through this area. So we now have the second miracle feeding, which takes place with a crowd of 4,000. Now, questions begin to arise as to why there are two such stories in the Gospel of Mark. Were there actually two feeding miracles, or is Mark emphasizing and making a point? We don't know. What we do know is the numbers of the crowds are different. That's specific information. We know that the first crowd was 5,000, and the second crowd is 4,000. We're told that the crowd is with Jesus for three days. So symbolically, that number three indicates for us a specific period of time when something significant takes place. Apparently in the three days, nobody's eaten and they're all hungry. Once again, what happens? The disciples, they look to Jesus to solve the problem, continuing to disappoint him. They've already seen how Jesus fed the 5,000. And here we have a similar situation. And yet, the disciples fail to use the tools Jesus has provided them so that they can feed the hungry. So what does this tell us? That the disciples continue to have a lack of faith. This time, they bring Jesus seven loaves of bread and a few fish. And Jesus repeats what we know um, through our Eucharist, that action of blessing um, that we see. So he takes what is given. He gives a blessing of thanks to God. He breaks it and he shares. So the bread and the fish are shared among the 4,000 men and their wives and their children. And the people eat their fill. And at the end of it, now they collect seven baskets filled with the leftovers. This second miracle feeding is thought to have taken place in Tiberias, which is located on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. So here we are in Tiberias. This would be in contrast to the first feeding, um, which they place in that area of Bethsaida, which is on the northeast side of Galilee. So this would have been, um, right here would have been the first feeding in this area, and the second feeding, they believe, is down in this area of Tiberias. After this miracle, um, Jesus and the disciples get into a boat and they arrive at the region known as Dalmuntha. Once there, he's greeted by the Pharisees, and they meet and challenge Jesus, and they ask for a sign from heaven to prove his legitimacy. Jesus now has given plenty of signs through his healings and his miracles. So he he refuses. He realizes that no matter what he does, the religious leaders are close-minded in regards to both Jesus and his kingdom message. So Jesus and the disciples board the boat again, and this time they cross to the other side of the Galilee. As they're heading toward the shore, um, Jesus warns warns his disciple against the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. Now, the disciples misunderstand the warning. They're quite literal. In fact, they've forgotten. They think it's because Jesus is talking about leaven and bread. It's because they forgot to bring bread along. Um, And in frustration, Jesus says, don't they still understand? How can they think Jesus would be asking for bread when he's perfectly capable of feeding first a crowd of 5,000 and then a crowd of 4,000? If he needed bread, he would have bread. The disciples just continue struggling with understanding who Jesus is. And time is running out. Um, The disciples are the ones who are going to remain after Jesus is gone. 
They're the ones who are going to take his message forward. So, yes, Jesus is frustrated. So what was Jesus referring to in his warning about leaven? Leaven or yeast in biblical literature is often equated with evil. Only a small amount of yeast is actually needed for dough to expand. So, in other words, it only takes a very little amount of bad knowledge to spread and infect the good. And that's what Jesus is referring to in regards to the Pharisees. The religious leaders need only to misstate something or take something out of context. And because they're so well-regarded and powerful, their word creates a lot of damage. And now they're so inflated with their own importance and pride that they fail to see their own failings and the damage they create through wrong understandings and misinterpretations of the word of God. So it's a lot of damage that's being done. Meanwhile, the disciples have taken everything literally, and they've missed the point Jesus was trying to make. So again, he says, can you not see? Can you not hear? Where's the faith? So here we have um, leaven, yeast, very, very fine grain. Um, Both in the Old and the New Testament, yeast, again, is often equated as a symbol of evil or corruption. And Jesus uses that term in regards to the evil disposition of like the Pharisees and also Herod Antipas. So you need only a little bit of yeast in bread dough, and in just a couple hours later, you'll have this explosion in front of you that you're seeing. The the dough will um, the yeast ferments the dough, and it doubles, triples, and quadruples in size. So here you have a diff- the, You can see the difference between what leavened bread, bread with leaven, looks like versus um, bread that doesn't have it, which would be the traditional flat bread. In this case, we have matzah in front of us. So that reference to leaven and yeast would make a lot of sense to an audience that is used to making their own bread. They totally get what he's saying. In the next healing story, that of the blind man, Jesus and the disciples are now back in Bethsaida. So in this healing, um, Jesus uses saliva on the blind man's eyes. And it actually takes him two attempts for the blind man's sight to be fully restored. This then raises for us the question in regarding to the faith of the blind man. In the first healing, the man actually begins to see, but the figures are like stick-like. They're like trees, it describes, walking around. It's the second time Jesus attempts the healing that the man's sight becomes clear. So this could indicate that there's a sense of growing disbelief in regards to Jesus. Because if you notice, the the crowds have been reduced in the miracle feedings from 5,000 to 4,000. And now it's taken two attempts at healing. However, the blind man is able to see clearly who Jesus is, unlike the hard-hearted disciples. The disciples and Jesus now travel from Bethsaida to Caesarea Philippi, which is located at the foot of Mount Hermon and the headwaters for the Jordan River. Caesarea Philippi is a lovely place. It's also called Banias. It's a Gentile city known to be the sanctuary of the pagan deity Pan. Jesus, Jesus is going to he chooses this location to ask the disciples. Who do the people say that I am? After several different answers, it's Peter who finally replies correctly, You are the Messiah. Now, as a Jew, Mark continues his outreach to the Jews, showing that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, the Anointed One. That word Messiah comes from the Hebrew masa, which means to anoint or smear with oil. And it's most often used in reference to kings. The image of the Messiah in the Jewish mind is that of the king, the priest, and the prophet, all three combined. Peter has realized that Jesus is something very different than any other prophet to date. So he refers to Jesus intentionally as the Messiah. And Jesus acknowledges Peter's statement, but he warns him against sharing that news. Now the scene moves into the first foretelling of the Passion by Jesus. As remarked upon earlier, Mark's audience expects to know the entire story in advance. 
So Jesus proceeds to tell the disciples in this first prediction of the passion that he's going to suffer at the hands of the religious leaders. He's going to die and that he will rise after three days. Notice the details that Jesus provides. The disciples simply do not understand. And Peter's response is one of denial. So Jesus then looks at Peter, who he just approved for what he was saying, but now when he faces this denial, he very abruptly tells Peter, um, he refers to Peter as Satan, and he tells him to get behind him, Satan being temptation. So Jesus is telling Peter not to tempt him. Peter is not God. He can't know what God has deemed Jesus is going to have to experience. So Peter, like all the disciples, he's struggling. He's getting a little bit of what Jesus is, but he's still struggling with understanding who and what Jesus is. So let's take a look at the first passion foretelling. We're on chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. Chapter 8, verses 31 through 33. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders the chief priest and the scribes, and be killed and rise after three days. He spoke this openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. At this, he turned around and looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. So this passion foretelling is the first in a series of three. The middle foretelling will be the key to the other two. In this first foretelling, Jesus is telling us who's going to reject them. Very specifically, the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. This is the ruling leadership. In fact, these three groups make up what we know as the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling religious court located um, in the Jerusalem temple. Um, In fact, the Sanhedrin is a total number of 70, plus the high priest for a total number of 71 in their body. Now, Jesus foretells um, that the Jews, his very own people, are going to reject him, the Son of Man. Hence, we have Peter's vehement denial. He's like, that's impossible. How could that be? Because in Peter's image of a Messiah, which is the traditional image, it's someone akin to King David, a prophet, a priest, a king, a judge. So in Judaism, um, the prophet Isaiah refers to a suffering servant, but never to a reference to a suffering Messiah. So their concept of a Messiah isn't what is going to be fulfilled in Jesus. That term Messiah within a faith community is understood to be God's representative. So someone who's doing God's work and is victorious. Hence, that idea of the suffering Messiah is very counter to anything Peter or the disciples would expect. Now, the disciples are in this area of Caesarea Philippi, okay, which is at the base of Mount Hermon. So they've traveled quite extensively from Capernaum up to Tyre to Sidon, and now they're here in the Caesarea Philippi area. The city of Caesarea Philippi which is also known as ancient Banias, is located um, at the foot of Mount Hermon. It's about 150 feet above sea level. As you can see in the picture, it's a lovely setting. It's lush. um, It's full of life. It's one of the main water sources of the Jordan River. Now, the ancient Canaanites actually built a sanctuary to the god Baal, um, and later the Greek and the Romans built sanctuaries at the same site, um, all because of this enormous cave that you can see in the picture, um, which they which they felt was the cave of Pan. Pan. And the cave um, appears to them to be bottomless with this endless supply of fresh water. Now, the cave of Pan, also known as the Grotto of Pan, um, is amazing to the ancients for several different reasons. The waters flow out of the cave. They feed the Jordan River. It's a bottomless pit, so they can't measure how much water is actually in there. Um, And during the time of Alexander the Great, the Greeks are so impressed with the area that they build the sanctuary on the site. Because nature, anything in nature, these impressive sites in nature, were very important to the Greeks. Um, They felt that they were the dwelling places of God. 
So the cave where Pan dwells creates awe and terror among ancient people. And they considered Pan uh, to be the one that, who was responsible for scary noises in the forest and other mysteries that they can't explain. And the Romans um, then continue the Greek tradition. Today, the area is actually designated a park, um, and it's a UNESCO heritage site, which is visited by many tourists to Israel. Now, these niches that you see built into these walls, in these niches were statues, some of them to the deity Pan and to other deities which people came to worship in this area. So here's an artistic rendition of what the sanctuary would have looked like um, probably during the time of Jesus. Again, ancient people would be visiting the sanctuary um, because they considered Pan to be an oracle or a seer. They would, something akin to like a fortune teller. So one that would give them revelations. And because of all the traffic to the site, it became a well-developed administrative area. A lot of money was exchanged at the sanctuary as people brought in donations and sacrifices to make two different gods, including the god Pan. So in order to keep track of all the money, um, the Romans made the site a banking center. So it's in this very um, Gentile, pagan, materialistic location that Jesus asked his disciples who the crowds think he is. They respond saying something, you know, Jesus, um, Jesus is John the Baptist's return, something Jesus is the prophet Elijah or another one of the prophets such as Jeremiah. Or Jeremiah. And when Jesus asked them, the disciples specifically, who they think he is, it's Peter who says um, in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is the Messiah. In the first commissioning of the disciples, Jesus sends them to preach, teach, and spread the word of the kingdom of heaven. In the second commissioning, Jesus now focuses on the meaning of discipleship. So Jesus is teaching them that to be a disciple of Jesus, it's very challenging and difficult. It's all about denial, giving up your current lifestyle, and turning everything over to God. And this includes um, giving up your family and friends and even your life. And Jesus talks about taking up the cross. In the Jewish mind, the cross is a terrible image, one that leads to crucifixion, a shameful death. So now they have this Messiah who's given these this foretelling um, where he's going to be crucified, and we have this talk about the cross. So very much not what the disciples had in mind of a Messiah. Let's take a look at, we're on chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 34 through 38. He summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. What profit is there for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? What would one give in exchange for his life? Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this faithless and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Now, crucifixion in the Roman world is a form of political punishment. It's used against political rebels. Non-Roman citizens and slaves were subject to crucifixion. Um, and in fact, to emphasize and remind people of the power of the Roman Empire, crosses with victims lined the roads leading into key Roman cities. It's a strong reminder of the power and the might of the Roman Empire, and also the consequences for anyone who dared to challenge, challenge that power. So in Judaism, crucifixion is a cursed way to die. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, verses 22 through 23, it talks about this, um, that to be hung on a tree, to be hung on wood is a curse. So to have a Messiah be crucified makes no sense to the disciples. It's beyond their comprehension. Jesus continues his message of discipleship, explaining that death isn't going to be the end. 
the shame of the cross is going to be overcome by the glory of God's presence in the resurrection. So Jesus is doing what? He's preparing the disciple for changes, including building up to the transfiguration. Now, Jesus travels with three of his disciples. <clears throat> he, you see him frequently with these three, Peter, James, and John, to a high mountain, we're told. And it's on this mountaintop that Mark will give us this incredible imagery of the transfiguration of Jesus. The clothes of Jesus become a brilliant white, and with him in this, this incredible light are the figures Moses, the lawgiver, and Elijah, the prophet, both of whom are traditional figures of wisdom in Jewish literature. And that term, transfigured, um, refers to metamorphosis, a change in outward appearance. For the three disciples, they're seeing their rabbi, their teacher, the Messiah, standing between the two key figures of the Jewish faith, Moses and Elijah. Moses, as a lawgiver, gave the Ten Commandments of God to the Jewish people, and Elijah, the prophet, gave many prophecies in regards to the future which were fulfilled, including the fall of northern Israel to the Assyrians and southern Israel, Judah, to the Babylonians. And in the midst of this dramatic scene, we have a cloud appearing and a voice is heard. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. So let's take a look at this scene. We're on chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. Chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain, apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He hardly knew what to say. They were so terrified. Then a cloud came, casting a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone, but Jesus alone with them. The disciples' response to what they're seeing, the transfiguration, is what? It's awe and fear. It's beyond their understanding. And then Peter has this strange response. He's like, okay, let's build tents. Now, why would Peter say that? One perspective is that as a Jew, the scene that is right before Peter evokes the memory of Moses' time with God during the Exodus. Um, and during this time, the tabernacle was built um, as a tent. And um, God would appear to Moses in the tab tabernacle, a place called the Holy of Holies. Also throughout the Exodus, God's presence among the Jewish people was known by the presence of a cloud over the tabernacle during the day. And then at night, it would be a cloud of fire over the tabernacle during the night, reminding them that God was among them as he's leading the people through this 40-year trek through the desert wilderness. So Peter, remembering this, could possibly suggesting the building of tents for Moses, Elijah, and Jesus um, as God dwells, is dwelling among them. Now, that voice from the cloud and the phrase, my beloved son, is one that was heard when? At the, at the baptism of Jesus, affirming his divinity. Now, God's voice is known to be thunderous, overwhelming, something that strikes the listener with awe and fear. And so this transfiguration scene repeats for us the power and the might of God. And it also affirms God's relationship with Jesus. Now, all three figures, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, they experienced the transfiguration. We know that Moses' face was changed after his exchanges with God. It became brilliant. It was so bright and light that the people said they couldn't look upon him, so he would cover his face with a veil. Uh, we know that Elijah is caught up in God's chariot of fire, we're told, and he ascends to heaven. However, Jesus is not just a reflection of God's glory. Jesus is the likeness of God in his glory. 
here on the mountaintop, and also, again, at the resurrection. So with these three individuals, what do we have? Look at the similarities here. Um, Moses represents the law. He faced political opposition from Pharaoh. He successfully defeated Pharaoh. He led the, his, the Hebrew people out of slavery and into freedom. And by the end of the Exodus, the Israelites were a people united in faith, ready to become a nation in the promised land. And then Moses passes on the leadership of the people to the warrior Joshua. Now, Elijah, he represents the prophets. Like Moses, he also faced political opposition, specifically from King Ahab and Jezebel of, North, of the northern kingdom, Israel. Elijah was also successful in defeating them, and he ascends to heaven on a fiery chariot. And then Elijah passes on his leadership to Eliza. Jesus represents wisdom. He provides that authoritative interpretation of the law. And as a prophet, his words are also fulfilled. So like Moses and Elijah, Jesus also deals with opposition, both from Jewish religious leadership and Roman leadership. And when Jesus leaves, he commissions his disciples to carry on his message after his ascension. Each of these three individuals are striking. But what does God say? He clearly acknowledges Jesus as his beloved son, and we're told that we're to listen to him. So of these three great figures, it's Jesus who stands apart. God has given Jesus the authority and the power. It is his word that is above all else.